Hi, I'm Lucy Shapiro. I'm a professor at Stanford University. Uh, I'm also a part of the Department of International Studies at Stanford University. And what I study are bacterial cells and how they work. That's going to be the first talk that I'm going to give you. And the second talk, I'm going to talk about why understanding bacterial cells and viruses has become absolutely critical in understanding the way in which we live in a global village. And I'm going to talk about, in the second talk, emerging infectious diseases and how understanding what goes on inside this tiny world, the world of viruses or the world of bacteria, is absolutely vital for dealing with emerging infectious diseases. Now my first talk, as you can see from the title, is the dynamics of the bacterial chromosome how it is organized, how it separates during segregation, and how it's coordinated with cell division. So we're going to go in to the inner workings of the bacterial cell and try to understand how these things happen. I should mention right before I start that the work we've done in understanding this bacterial cell has helped us design an entirely new class of antibiotics. I'm not going to talk about that today, but it's something that is the offshoot of all work on either bacterial cells or viruses. So now let's talk about Colobacter. Colobacter is a simple bacterial cell. Uh, in fact, the name Colobacter, colo means, means stalk in, Greeks, in Greek. So that this is a stalked bacterium. You can see the stalk here. What happens is that at every cell division, which you see happening here, you have an asymmetric division. So you get a swarmer cell from one part and a stalked cell from the other. The swarmer cell can swim away to find food. The stalk cell sits down on a rock and waits for food to come to it, and then it divides again. This swarmer cell, which is shown here going through the cell cycle, uh, will first release the flagellum, which is this wavy thing down here. These are pili. You get rid of both the flagellum and pili. This circle inside the cell indicates the DNA. And once you differentiate from this cell with a flagellum, which is called a swarmer cell, into a stalk cell, you initiate the replication of the chromosome. As the chromosome is replicating, which is shown here, you're turning on lots of genes that allow you to build a new flagellum at this pole opposite the stalk and you turn on all the genes for cell division and chromosome segregation. Now, indicated below this cartoon of the cell cycle are all these boxes. And these boxes indicate individual modules that happen at this time during the cell cycle. And these modules have many, many genes within them. So, for example, flagella ejection means that there are like 45 genes that have to be turned on to get rid of it and then to rebuild it. Then as you move through the cell cycle, what happens is you initiate DNA replication, flagella biogenesis, pili biogenesis, and all of these functions have to be coordinated and regulated and be a part of turning on and turning off the replication of the chromosome. So let's now ask, well, how is this happening? What what about the chromosome is something that we really have to understand? So shown here is a picture of an E. coli cell. That's a bacterial cell, very similar to Colobacter, that's been very extensively studied. And in this particular picture, it's been exploded on an EM grid so that you can actually see the DNA as it's released from the cell. And it's really quite a mess. Uh, there's a huge amount of DNA, and it doesn't really look like it has any organization. But in fact, when you understand that in this small bacterial cell that is approximately two microns, it's very little, ten times smaller than the smallest eukaryotic cell, the DNA is a thousand times longer than the cell if it were completely stretched out. So we have to compact this DNA very tightly into the cell. And remember that inside the cell, you're going to have to 
duplicate this DNA, make a complete copy of this great big mess. And while that's happening, you have to transcribe the genes that are allowing you to proceed through the cell cycle. So how is this all happening? Well, one of the first things we did was first ask, are there specific parts of that chromosome that sit at specific parts in the cell? And what I show you here is an experiment in which we have actually lit up a particular pole of the cell. And so up in this picture, you're going to see red dots and you're going to see green dots. The red dots indicate the origin of replication. So the bacterial chromosome exists as a circle. And in that circle, you have an origin sequence where you initiate DNA replication. DNA replication in bacterial cells proceeds bidirectionally, ending at a terminus. And what I'm showing you here is in this little swarmer cell, we have a one origin at the pole right down by the flagellum, and the terminus winds up at the other pole. So now as we begin replication, and go through the cell cycle, these are in synchronized cells, you can see that the very first thing that happens is that these origin duplicates and a new one goes to the opposite pole. Then as you continue through the cell cycle, you see finally you've duplicated the termini, which means you've completed DNA replication. But this is, these cells are dead cells. You know, I synchronize the cells, I do uh, in, in situ hybridization of a labeled probe, I want to see how these chromosomes are actually able to move a particular locus. How does it move that origin from one pole of the cell to the other? And let me show you the technique that we now use to do this. Uh, <clears throat> here I have a plasmid sitting in the cell, and this plasmid has on it a LAC I gene which is a gene that codes for a protein that can sit on a specific binding site on the chromosome. What we do is we hook that gene up to a fluorescent tag, so it turns on a bright light. Sitting next to it on the plasmid, I in fact have another protein, it codes for another protein, trip R, that sits next to a different fluorescent tag. So one is shown in blue, the other is shown in yellow. In the meantime, what we've done is we've inserted into the chromosome, shown here, repetitive copies of a LAC O gene, or in fact, a TET O gene. And these are the binding sites that we're putting into a specific place on the chromosome, so that once we turn on these labeled tagged proteins, we can actually visualize where it is in the cell. So down here, I show the cell. And in one part here, let's just look at TET-O. Uh, TET-O is now being bound by those little lit up uh, uh, proteins that bind to TET-O, and we can actually see them in the cell. And if we turn on both, and let's say we tag two different loci in the chromosome, we can then see two different site, two different dots as shown down here. So given that, <clears throat> what we started to do was ask, where are these positions relative to the origin of replication? Here's the origin of replication. It's tagged with something yellow. And if it's tagged with yellow, when we look at the cell, which is shown diagrammatically here, we see that the origin is in fact closest to the uh, to the flagella, which is what we saw when we did that other experiment. Next, what we did <clears throat> is we labeled another part of the chromosome with a different color. And we said, well, where is that going to go in the cell? And when we looked at that in the fluorescent microscope, we saw that it was moved away, coming in this direction. Then we labeled up yet another, and that's shown here, and that comes next. And then we labeled yet another. And so what we're beginning to see is a linear order of the genes in, on the chromosome that reflects where they line up in the cell. This was a big surprise.
It tells us that the DNA sitting in this cell is not a disorganized mess, and individual loci probably know where they are. Now, at this point, we were just looking at a few loci. What we have to do is look at lots. And so the way in which we looked at lots is we took this uh, Mariner transposon that had all these TET-O sequences lined up on them, and we jumped this transposon into the chromosome, shown here, so that we have, we actually jumped in 114 different sites. One transposon jumped in a particular site in an individual cell. So every cell has just one transposon in a particular site. And then what we did was we mapped and measured where each one was. And as you can see here on this half, I show little dots and we sequenced and measured exactly in each individual cell where that transposon was. On the other side, I have yet another group that we measured at a particular site in the cell. And then, because each one of these was tagged with a fluorescent tag, we were going to be able to see where it was in the living cell. And here's the answer. The answer is that there is a linear relationship between where that TETO array was put in the cell, uh, on the genome, and where it exists in the cell. So therefore, we now know that the chromosome is a highly ordered structure and that every gene has a specific cellular address. The origin is near the flagellum, the terminus is near the top of the cell, and every locus in between goes to a specific place. Furthermore, using this technique, we're able to actually follow the movement, let's say, of the origin in real time in living cells. And <clears throat> up here, what I show you is moving now through the cell cycle and looking quite closely at this is the origin. And then as soon as replication starts, the replisome, which is the machine that copies DNA, is laid down on top of it. And as soon as you initiate replication, you see that the, uh, that the dot that lights up the origin travels to the other pole. And I show this down here. And if you can watch this, here's a swarmer cell with the origins at this pole. And they are moving right down to the other end of the cell very rapidly. And when we first saw this, we just couldn't believe it. Remember, these cells are tiny. And we're looking at them in real time living cells and watching a newly duplicated segment of DNA harpoon across the cell and hit the other pole. And I show that in three different panels here. In each one, you can follow the origin of replication as it moves to the other pole. This allowed us <clears throat> to actually design a computer algorithm that watched the movement of these origins and mapped out for us the rate of movement of the fluorescent tag. So we were able to show that it takes 0.2 microns per minute for the new origin, which is this blue line, to move from one pole of the cell to the other, independent of cell length. Now, it has been thought for many, many years, because we really didn't know, but it seemed like a logical thing to say, that this great mass of the bacterial chromosome duplicated as a mass and a mess and was attached to the membrane of the cell and the chromosomes only got pulled apart by the growth of the cell. This turns out not to be true. The copying of the DNA and then the movement of the segments as it's being copied occurs simultaneously and is independent of the growth of the cell. And that again is shown here. So now what I've done is just to help you get through this and understand exactly what I've said, this shows the dynamics of bacterial chromosome segregation. So we start here in G1 phase with our organized chromosome, our origin, our terminus, and this yellow dot is showing a particular locus, and let's follow these. <clears throat> 
So as this swarmer cell releases the flagellum, and it'll grow a stalk in a minute, what happens is that the replosome gets formed on this part of the cell, that's that green stuff, and replication begins. And as you move, what happens is that the replosome is spewing out DNA in both directions. The origin has been harpooned to the other end of the cell, and as you spool out DNA, it is pulled, separated, pulling to the two poles. Now, if you follow your little yellow dot here, the, uh, as this guy is duplicated, what's happening is it is moved to the other, to the incipient new cell in exactly the same place, like a mirror image of where it was before. And then cell division happens, and we're back to the beginning, so that when this cell divides, the top and the bottom will look very similar. But what could be doing this? So it was thought of for many, many years that the bacterial cell was too small to require proteins that help things move. It was too small to have particular protein complexes in specific places. Its DNA was not wrapped up in a nucleus. So people thought, well, the cell is so little that proteins and pieces of DNA could be anywhere in the cell in, many, in milliseconds by diffusion. In fact, this is not true. Bacterial cells have proteins that control movement. They have localization of complexes at different places in the cell. And one of the candidates for helping this happen is an actin-like protein. Now, actin has been well known for many, many years in eukaryotic cells, being involved in cytoskeletal functions and movement. Bacterial cells have an actin homologue, and that's called MREB. So we decided to investigate how MREB might help or function in the cellular movements, like moving that origin. Uh, the MREB actin, this one is uh, showing the polymerization of that actin uh, in, in another kind of cell. Down here, it shows, in fact, how this actin is organized in almost all bacterial cells, including Colobacter, and it's organized in a spiral all the way down the length of the cell. And so in order to study this particular protein and how it might work, we, of course, made mutants knocked it out, the cells change shape, they become sort of round balls, and then ultimately die. So the cell really needs this. But I wanted something that would immediately inactivate that actin in some way. So what we did was go, well, first of all, we read the literature, and found that a group of people led by uh, Dr. Wachi uh, in Japan had discovered a small compound a, we'll call it A22, that when applied to E. coli, which is usually a rod, causes it to form a sphere. Now, Wachi didn't know how this compound worked, but since we know that if you make a mutation in MREB in that actin, you get cells to ball up and form a sphere, we figured, well, let's collaborate with him and try to find out how this works. So here's the compound. It's easy to make. It's a very simple compound. And the way in which we determined how this works is we carried out a screen for mutants that are resistant to this little compound A22. And we found, as you can see here, lots of them. And uh, we then showed that of these uh, 20 alleles, uh, all of them were able to grow in the presence of A22, which means they're resistant. And uh, then we proved that this was true by replacing the mutant gene with a wild-type gene, and you go back to sensitivity. And then we prove it in, in fact, uh, in a wild-type background with the mutant gene. By sequencing exactly where these genes exist on the chromosome, we were able to show that each and every one of those 20 alleles that are resistant to MREB exists in the ATP binding domain of the actin monomers. Therefore, A22 is a specific inhibitor of MREB function. Now, using this inhibitor, we were able to ask, 
does the origin move if we've knocked out the function of MREB? But first, we had to prove that MREB does not disrupt DNA replication or initiation, and in fact it doesn't. A control is using a compound hydroxyl urea that does stop it, but if you treat it with A22, it does not. So now we're ready for the experiment, and here's the experiment. What you do is, as I told you before, if you start with a swarmer cell, the green dot is the origin. As the swarmer cell differentiates into a stock cell, you have the separation of the origins. One goes, is, remains at this pole, the other goes to the other side. Then you go through the cell cycle and you wind up with the same organization of the chromosome in both. Now here's the experiment. What we did was we added A22 to these swarmer cells and asked, what's going to happen? Well, what happened really surprised us. DNA replication started, and you made two new little origins, but nothing moved to the other end. And as you went through the cell cycle, because you were not separating the chromosomes, you didn't divide the cell. And using a cell sorter, fax, we were able to show that we indeed had uh, just, we had duplicated the DNA, so we had two chromosomes, but they had not separated. This tells us now that MREB, actin, is important for the separation of the newly replicated origin of DNA replication. We then went on and showed that MREB binds to some structure at that part of the cell, at that part of the origin. Now, what I've shown you is that we have coincident DNA replication and segregation. How does the cell use this to coordinate all its different functions? And it does so in two different ways, so I'm going to tell you two very short stories. One way it does it is controls the spatial regulation of where you put the cell division site. Now let me show you how this works. So what I've shown you here is another cartoon of the cell cycle. Shown in green is something called the Fitz-Z tubulin which is a protein that uh, is able to go to mid-cell and contract the cell to carry out cytokinesis. And as you can see here, it's in the center of the cell. Cell division happens, and when it finishes, you still have some of this Fitz-Z left at that pole. So now let's go back and look at this swarmer cell that has just resulted from cell division. And what we have here is the Fitz-Z left at the pole. At the other pole is the origin. And bound to that origin is a newly discovered protein, which we call MIP-Z. So we have MIP-Z bound to this origin. We have the Fitz-Z tubulin at the other side of the cell. And when the origin with its MIP-Z moves to the other part of the cell, then the Fitz-Z monomers go to mid-cell. So the question that we're faced with is, might MIP-Z directly inhibit Fitz-Z assembly at the correct cell site? So here's what this thing looks like. What I show you here is a piece of DNA in which we have the origin, shown here, and a protein called PAR-B lines up all the way around the origin, and then this MIP-Z protein forms by binding to PAR-B but not very tightly, so that it in fact forms some kind of gradient. And when we look very closely using the fluorescent microscope, uh, labeling either uh, the, PAR -P, the PAR B with GFP or in fact the MIPZ protein with YFP, we, you can see that the PAR B is very tight at the poles, whereas the MIPZ forms a gradient with the least expression at mid cell. So now what we did was we purified MIPZ, we purified the Fitz-Z tubulin, and what I show you here is that MIPZ is forming, uh, is in the absence of MIPZ, the Fitz-Z mo monomers form these long polymers. This is just a higher magnification. But if we then add MIPZ to it, these big long monomers, monomers get very small and curvy and they're non-functional, telling us that MIPZ is an inhibitor of the polymerization 
of the Fitz-Z tubulin that will carry out cytokinesis. With this information, we can now draw a model. So here is a cartoon of the colobacter cell. This work was done by a postdoc in the lab, Martin Thanbickler. And this little blue dot here is the origin of replication. Uh, nothing is happening yet. This is a cell that is just differentiated from a swarmer to a stalk cell. At the other pole of the cell is Fitz-Z, waiting to do something. Here at the origin, we have the par B, and we have all this MIP Z sitting on it. Now, as soon as the origin is duplicated, that par B MIP Z complex lines up on that as well. So we now have it on two. And as it moves across the cell, and as the MIP Z hits the Fitz Z at the other pole, it moves away to the region of lowest concentration. Therefore, the movement of these origins from one pole to another using an inhibitor like MIPZ allows you to polymerize FITZ at the place in the cell where there's lowest concentration of inhibitor and that is the center of the cell. Now the second story I'll tell you, and it's really the last story I'll tell you, is that another way that the cell integrates these various functions, integrates DNA replication and segregation with the pro progression of the cell cycle is to control the master regulators, to control the expression of the master regulators. And it does this by using an epigenetic mechanism, which is DNA methylation. So if you have a chromosome of colobacter in a swarmer cell, there are sequences in the DNA, GANTC, that get methylated on the adenine. And, once it, and when you start the cell cycle, you're methylated both on Watson and Crick, on both strands of the DNA. Once you begin replicating, though, the two newly replicated chromosomes are only hemimethylated. They are methylated where they started, but the new one is not. And that's going to be the epigenetic control mechanism that's used. So what I show here is the genetic circuitry that is controlled by three master regulators and how that allows you to move through the cell cycle. The three master regulators are a protein called DNAA. This is made first during the cell cycle and it controls about 40 genes. When this is turned on, and it's turned on just for a specific time in the cell cycle, uh, it then turns on the expression of another master regulator, GCRA, which controls about 50 genes. Then later in the cell cycle, GCRA turns on one of the promoters of the third master regulator, CTRA, and CTRA controls about 95 genes. So you have a cascade of master regulators that control all the functions that allow you to proceed through the cell cycle. And what I'm going to show you is that a gene that encodes an enzyme that actually puts those methylation sites on the DNA is a critical event in making this a cyclical regulatory pathway. And here I show you that the first thing that gets turned on is DNAA, then what happens is GCRA is turned on, then CTRA is turned on, and when it finishes that, CTRA turns on this DNA methyltransferase, which comes back, is turned on at the completion of DNA replication to label up all the loci, so you go back to a fully methylated chromosome. The critical question is, with respect to DNA, A, in fact, what turns on this cascade? How do you get that DNA A to be turned on? And this was quite a surprise. Uh, it turns out that if you look at the chromosome, we have the origin at one point, the terminus at the other. The DNA A gene sits right near the origin. The CTRA gene sits on the other side and a little further down. Now when you begin, very beginning of replication, the origin and the whole rest of the chromosome exists in the fully methylated state. So you're methylated on Watson and Crick. Uh, in the fully methylated state, 
this promoter for the DNAA gene is able to be read. There are methylation sites in that promoter, and it can only be read in the fully methylated state. However, the CTRA gene shown here can only be read if it's hemimethylated. And the cell uses the methylation state of the chromosome as a clock to tell you when to turn on DNAA and when to turn it off, when to turn on CTRA and when to turn it off. So at the very beginning, when it is all fully methylated, you can transcribe the DNAA gene, but you cannot transcribe the CTRA gene. Once replication is initiated and you copy the DNAA gene, then you get two copies that are each hemimethylated. Remember, I told you that it, if it can only be transcribed if it's in the fully methylated state. So as soon as you get two copies that are hemimethylated, DNAA is not transcribed. Bango, it's off. But it's already done its thing. It's allowed DNA replication to start. It's controlled genes that make up the replosome that copy DNA, and it's done its thing. Then what happens is, as you continue going through the replication of the chromosome, you pass through the CTRA gene. That goes from a fully methylated state where it can't be transcribed to a hemimethylated state where it can be transcribed and then it's turned on. So in fact, what I've now shown you is that the passage of the replication fork controls the methylation state and activity of two promoters of these critical global regulators that allow the progression of the cell cycle. So then to give you a summary of what I have shown you, this again shows you the familiar cell cycle that we've been talking about. And I've shown you that origin movement, and we've watched the origin move, is dependent on MREB actin. A protein complex coordinates DNA replication in the positioning of the cell division site. That was that MIPZ protein that forms a gradient. Replication and segregation are simultaneous. And finally, that whole transcriptional regulatory network is coordinated with DNA replication via the methylation state of the chromosome, an epigenetic mechanism. So what I have shown you is that all these various modules that are turned on and off through the cell cycle are all hooked up and coordinated with the act of replicating the cell's DNA. So I would just like to thank the very, very talented bunch of students and uh, postdocs in the lab who've done the work I've spoken about. Uh, Martin Thanbickler uh, did that very pretty work on the MIPZ, Justine Collier on the DNAA regulation, Anne Reisenauer on the control of CTRA, Natalie Dye and Zemmer Gatai, who's just left the lab to start his own in Princeton, have worked on the MREB actin, Patrick Vioye and Rasmus Jensen on the organization of the chromosome, and I would like to state now that a lot of our work is done in collaboration with a lab that is really a physics lab. And this other lab is led by Harley McAdams. And he's a physicist. He's also a professor in the Department of Developmental Biology at Stanford. And his students all get their PhDs in physics or electrical engineering. And we work by coordinating our labs completely so that when his students, who are physicists and engineers, start their thesis work, they do it in the same lab with all the geneticists and biochemists who are working in my lab. So at this point, we have a completely interdisciplinary crew, and it has opened up new areas of investigation, which I don't believe could have been done without that. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much.